morning. Uh, it's Palm Sunday. I, I was just, just struck me a while ago that um, if this is your first time in church, uh, you might be like, what on earth is going on? Where, is it, where do all these palm leaves come from? A little bit will be explained. Hopefully a lot will be explained uh, in the next half hour. Uh, do you want to turn to Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11? You can find it on pages 1026 on uh, the church Bibles. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. And then just stick a finger in it and we'll come back to it. We are a people that look for signs to tell us the times. We, we mark our lives with signs. You know, we mark events, relationships, achievements, you know, events, things like birthday badges, relationships with wedding bands or uh, status updates, events. Uh, it's the London Marathon today. Our very own uh, Phil Williams, one of the curates here, is running uh, for Alpha. And at the end, he will get a little certificate and a pat on the back. Uh, we, we mark our lives with signs. We, we also mark the seasons with signs. Imagine you fell into a deep, deep sleep. Hopefully not now. Um, but imagine you fell into a deep sleep and then you woke up after some time and there was a stocking at the end of your bed. You would know that it was Christmas. You, you sleep again, you wake up after a long time and there was a chocolate egg at the end of your bed. You would know that it was Easter. If you woke up and there was a pumpkin, you'd know it was Halloween. And if you woke up and everything was green, you would know it was St. Patrick's Day. But what if, having been asleep for a long time, you woke up and at the end of your bed was a green stocking filled with pumpkins and eggs? You wouldn't know what the times were. The signs wouldn't match the times. The signs would all be jumbled together. And in a nutshell, that's what we have on Palm Sunday. Uh, we've been doing a series, as David said, called The Way, where we follow Jesus on his way to the cross and ask ourselves what it means for us to follow Jesus uh, to the cross as well. And we've seen that his, his public ministry was he was baptised and filled with the Spirit. He then taught and he preached and he did signs and wonders. And now he has his face set towards the cross. And he, next week we celebrate when, when he goes to the cross to atone for our sins. But, but that's next week. That's Good Friday. That's Easter. Today we find ourselves on Palm Sunday, a week before that, and we see Jesus arrive in Jerusalem. Let's have a look at the passage. So this is Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. It will come up on the screens as well. And I'm also going to add a little bit from later on in the chapter because we're lucky today. Um, Mark 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives... Jesus sent two of his disciples saying, go to the village ahead of you. Just as you enter it, you will find a colt there tied, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Uh, say to them, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and they found a colt outside in the street tied to a doorway. As they were untying it, some people standing there said, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and put their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. A little while later, we hear that on coming to Jerusalem the next day, Jesus entered the temple and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he did this, he taught them and said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began for began to look for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Amen. Jesus arrives in Jerusalem for the Passover. And in doing so, he's making a really clear statement. He's making a sign. 
The Passover was uh, the central feast in the Jewish faith. It was the big celebration where they celebrated when God brought them out of slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea towards the promised land, uh, the great exodus. And Jesus chooses this festival at which he will be crucified to make the point that he is our great high priest. He is our high sac- he is our f- final sacrifice. He is the one who will lead us not just from physical slavery, but for full, from full slavery into full freedom of life. But Jesus arrives at the Passover festival with all the symbols and signs of another festival. He arrives with all the symbols and signs of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a different festival. It's a festival celebrated by the Jews uh, in winter time. And, and at that period, it looked back to about 300 years before when a guy called Judas Maccabeus had got together an army and led it out against invaders invading Israel and had defeated them. He'd then come to Jerusalem. He had ridden in in great celebration and people had waved palm leaves and they'd put their cloaks on the ground and they'd shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of our father David. And he had come and he'd rededicated the temple and was crowned king. Every year the Jews would celebrate Hanukkah when God brought them a king. And Jesus takes the symbols of the Passover and the symbols of Hanukkah and he collides them together. And in doing so, he is making a point. He's making a point. He's trying to get our attention. He's trying to say, pay attention. Look at me. It's kind of like, you know, when you're trying to get somebody's attention in a crowded place, you're like, hey, hey, hey. You, you, and you're, not, you're not quite sure whether to shout louder or not. He is being really clear that he wants our attention. In bringing the Passover and Hanukkah together, Jesus is saying, yes, I am your priest. I'm your perfect sacrifice, but I am also your king. Yes, I have come as a priest to deal with your past, but I've also come as a king to lead you into your future. And then he makes it clear what kind of king he is. He uses these signs and symbols. Firstly, he says, I am a confrontational king. Up until this point, whenever Jesus has been doing ministry and anything interesting, anything that's miraculous that will make people like really excited, he goes, shh, don't tell anyone. So, so he'll perform some amazing miracle and then he'll say, go home. Don't, don't tell anyone. Just, just go home. Carry on living your life. And, he'll, and, and the reason is, is because these miracles are not just good miracles for these people. They are signs and wonders that point to the coming kingdom. Each one of Jesus' miracles shows that this world that is not as it should be is under his authority, that he is the true king. And if he is the true king, then others are not. With each miracle, with each sign and wonder, uh, it puts more pressure on the leaders and authorities to either put Jesus in jail or to put him to death, as they had done with John. But Jesus isn't ready yet. He still has things to teach. He still has things to do. So he says, shh. But then he comes to Jerusalem. He comes to the kind of the center of the political power, the center of all the authority. And here's where you and I might have been, you know, you might be bold on the outskirts, but when you come to, you know, the capital, you might play it down a little, come through the side door. But he doesn't do that. He comes in with a parade. He comes in with a festival. He whips the crowd up shouting. He comes in, it's like the West End on tour. He's making a fuss. He is making a commotion. He's doing this to bring an ultimation, ultimatum to the people in Jerusalem. He is saying, either crown me or kill me, but you can't have anything else. Jesus is a unique person. He is the most humble person in the world, but he is not modest. He's the least modest person that ever existed. He, he is truly humble. He came to a stable. He didn't come to a palace. He spent his time with the last, the least, and the lost, those on the edge of society. But he wasn't modest. He said things like, I am the creator of the heavens and the earth. He said that I will judge you when you die. You know, those are not modest statements. And Jesus comes on Palm Sunday in absolute humility, but with no modesty. 
And he says, you need to crown me or you need to kill me, but you can't just like me and then walk away. And this makes sense. You know, um, imagine if you invited Nikki, our vicar, Nikki Gumbel, round for dinner. And he got to your front door for dinner and you went, oh, hi, Nikki, come in, Nikki, but stay out, Gumbel. You were like, oh, come and sit down over here, Nikki, but Gumbel, stay on the doorstep. It would make no sense. You, you can't separate somebody like that. And in coming with the symbols of the king and the symbols of the priest, Jesus is saying, you can't separate me. You can't say, come in saviour, but stay out Lord. You can't say, come in helper, but stay out king. You can't have a bit of both. He comes as a confrontational king and he says to us, you need to choose. He comes in in confrontation, but he also comes in counterintuitively. How do we know this? How do we know he's a counterintuitive king? He comes on a donkey. Like, let's not miss that point. You know, we kind of flower it up with nice things, but a donkey, it, it, that, that's counterintuitive. Like, um, all up until this point of the story, Jesus' disciples are kind of egging him on. Like, come on, come on, let's go on. Let's get this into action. Come on, you've said all these things, but let's put this into practice. Let's have this great revolution. And the whole time, Jesus is like, whoa, whoa, come on, slow down, guys. And then he rebukes them and he's like, look, my plans are not your plans. And then they get to Jerusalem and Jesus is like, all right, guys, we're going to ride in. And they're like, yeah, this is the moment. This is the moment where we go in, we get to be famous. We get to see everything that we've been expecting and hoping for. And Jesus goes, right, two of you, go ahead, go and get my ride. And it's a cult. And they would have been so disappointed. A, a cult, the, the word is polos, and it means one of three things. It's either a baby horse, a little donkey, or a pony. Now, now, of all three of those options, none of them are very good for traveling on. Like, it's, none of them are good options. Like, imagine it. Like, it's ridiculous. Jesus would have been on this animal that was barely able to carry his weight. Like, his feet would have been dragging along the ground. Like, he, his head would have been below the crowd. If he'd stood up, he'd have been more visible. He sat down on this little animal. Can, like, it, it doesn't, can you imagine Braveheart, him doing that big speech, but on a very small horse? Like, it, it's not the same impact. Can you imagine Putin, right? in on a pony. Like, like, leaders don't do that. People who are revolutionaries, kings don't do that. What is he saying? Um, there was a video that went viral uh, a few years ago, and it showed, um, a, we're an Anglican church, and Anglicans uh, sometimes like to dress up, and we like to process as part of our worship. We don't tend to at this service, but come to Queensgate in the morning, you'll see us in robes and with processions as part of our worship. And um, there was a video of this cathedral, and you had all the clergy getting ready outside, all in their robes and their chasubles, all ready to process in. You've got the bishop with his staff, the acolytes, the deacons, all of these people, and they're all queuing up, and they start processing in, and then at the end, a man just joins the procession dressed as Darth Vader from Star Wars and just processes in with his lightsaber. And it, and it was very funny and it's good not to take ourselves too seriously and the video went viral. He was mocking them. He was mocking their rituals. That's what Jesus is doing. He's mocking, he's parodying, he's satiring this thing everyone would have known about. You know, when a king defeated a nation, he rode in to victory, to the capital, on a stallion, on a horse, with people shouting, with people waving banners, with palm trees being waved. You know, this was a big moment when you had a victory. And Jesus is saying, I am coming to do a victory, but I'm mocking all other ways of salvation. I'm mocking all other ways of being saved. He comes in on a donkey. Jesus comes and the way he saves, he says, I am coming in as a king and I am coming in in victory but not like other kings. He doesn't come in strength to kill. He comes in weakness to die for us. And that is good news because we can follow him. Jesus could have said, I've done great things. I've taught great lessons. I've broken taboos. Now you go out and you do the same and then you will be saved. But that would have been salvation by strength for the strong which would exclude all of us. Jesus comes in weakness 
which means that you and I can follow him. He comes in weakness, not to kill, but to die. To, to die on a cross, not, not throned on a, on a throne in a palace, but on a cross outside the city. He comes as a counterintuitive king. And there's some outworkings of this. Like, often we come to God when we perceive a need. We, we can, I'm very forgetful. I could ignore him and then suddenly have a need. And it's like, oh, here I am. You know, when 9-11 happened, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, the Sunday night service was overfulling. They reckon there were 10,000 people down Ludgate Hill. Like when, when the financial crash happened, we had one of the biggest ever alphas here with people in suits lining the driveway. You know, w- when we perceive our need, we come to God. Uh, like the crowds here, they were there shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna doesn't mean hooray. It means save us. In particular, it means save us now. The crowds thought that their ultimate need was political liberation And Jesus says, actually, your deepest need is reconciliation with your Father in heaven. We come to God with our needs and he says, actually, that might be what you think you need, but here is what I know you need. Tim Keller has this line and he says, in our daily lives, in nearly any situation, God will always give us what we would have asked for if we know what he knows. God will always give us what we would have asked for if we know what he knows. And so the crowds come and they want this and we come to him and we want this and he says, no, actually, this is your deepest need. But he doesn't stop there. He is a God that gives and he gives and he gives again. And so he brings reconciliation and he also completely undermines the Roman Empire. But it starts like this, which is not what they thought. This also highlights to us the worthlessness, complete utter lack that we find in human celebrity. Is there any other better picture of the the fickle nature of collective human culture than, than this, than Palm Sunday? You know, Jerusalem wasn't that big. Those people that were there shouting, Hosanna on Sunday, on Friday would have been there shouting, crucify him. You know, don't live your life for human affirmation. Don't live your life just for the next like or the next follower or or the next bit of celebrity because you, you might be one of the lucky ones who gets it, but then you'll be on the scrap heap next week. The world's love lasts till Friday. God's love endures forever. The psalmist says his love never, never, never fails. It's love that is stronger than death. We come to God with what we think we need and he gives us what we actually need and way beyond that. He is a counterintuitive king. Finally, he is a coming king. Jesus comes and and what they are all expecting is that this is the guy who's going to sort it all out. Everything that we think we need, he's going to sort it all out now. And Jesus says, actually, I'm coming to start something. I had a philosophy teacher and uh, people always used to say to him, why doesn't God just come and deal with evil? Why doesn't he just come and judge all the bad things in the world now? And he said, well, maybe he will and he'll start with you, and which obviously is not the answer we want. Jesus came to reconcile us with our Father so that when he comes again to put an end to evil, he won't need to put an end to us. You know, Jesus, there's something really shocking just about the donkey. I mean, the donkey is hilarious, but it's also really weird. Like, you don't need to know much about animals. Like, I don't know if you ever tried to ride a dog or a cat as a child. Like, animals aren't up for being ridden, especially an animal that is a farmyard animal that has never been ridden before. The, the, The term is you have to break an animal in. You know, nature is not as it should be. Nature is broken. It is in, you know, it's not aligned correctly. But yet this animal that is brought to Jesus, that has never been ridden, that is young, is at peace and carries Jesus to Jerusalem. You know, and that's not an easy journey. It's uphill on a desert road. 
It's not like it was a calm afternoon. There were people shouting and screaming and waving, and yet this donkey carries Jesus to Jerusalem. That, that is a picture of the coming king. He starts something now that he will bring to completion, that he will bring peace and shalom to all of creation. And he starts with us as he reconciles us to our Father and then wants us to be involved in the reconciliation of all things to him. There's a good, good thing to do, a good practice when reading Bible stories is to try and identify yourself as one of the characters. And the person I identify most with in this story is the donkey. I don't know about you, but, um, but I was tied up. I was confused. I was untamed. And then Jesus came and he brought peace, and then he used me to bring glory to himself. Is there a better picture of the Christian life than, than that little pony, that little donkey in the story? And, and then Jesus finishes this chapter by starting the downfall of the old way of life. He goes into the temple and he trashes the place. Like he goes in, he throws people out. He like, in one account says he has a whip. Like he, he lets the animals loose. He turns over the money tables. This was the busiest time of the year and he just puts an end to it. And he says, as he was doing all that, he was teaching them. So maybe we could try that like one week. Like it'd be a bit different. And um, he puts an end to the temple. All cultures, all countries at that time had temples. We still do have temples, but they look different. But temples tell us something. They, they, they have presuppositions. One, they say that there is a God, there is a divine. The next thing it assumes is that we are not in relationship with the divine, with the future as we should be. And it also assumes that you can't just walk up to the divine and go, hello, and just be in relationship. That there is a gap, there is a divide, there is something. You know, so temples are made where you would sacrifice to bridge the gap. Now they look like shopping malls or universities or fitness centers, but then they were, they were places where you'd come and bring animals to sacrifice something to bridge the gap between you and the divine. A Buddha, uh, one of the last things he said was strive endlessly. That that's how they would bridge the gap. Some would be with animal sacrifice, some would people sacrifice with our lives, our giving, but there is a sacrifice that closes the gap that tries to bring us closer. But in every other religion, ideology or philosophy, they say you build the temple, you find the priest, you bring the sacrifice, you pay the price. Jesus shuts the temple down and in doing so he says, I am the temple, I am the priest, I am the sacrifice and I will pay the price. Jesus comes as our priest to deal with our past and he comes as a king to lead us into our future and he has reconciled us with our Father so that we can be part of the reconciliation of all things to him. He is a king that comes in love. He is a king that comes with discipline and with strength and with release and with overflowing and abundance of love. And the question is, do we want to crown him or do we want to kill him? Will we follow him today? Amen.